from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's teaching social emotional learning through music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, we welcome composer Kate Nishimura. Please welcome our host of teaching social emotional learning through music, Scott Edgar. Hi, my name is Scott Edgar. Thank you for joining us for the next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. Today, we are so fortunate to be joined by composer Kate Nishimura. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. We are so honored. Your music has so much heart. It has so much potential to connect to students' lives. So I can't wait to hear how we're going to connect some of these dots between your work and social and emotional learning. Thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Can we start off by just talking a little bit about your journey getting uh, to where you are right now? Who are some major influences in your life and how has that filtered into the amazing work that you're creating now? Yeah, for sure. So um, I was raised, you know, in a in a family that was not particularly musical, but had a great appreciation for music. So my parents were always listening to music in the house. The radio was on in the car. They were interested in in taking me to the ballet and to the symphony orchestra concerts for kids and things like that. So although I was maybe the first formal musician in the family, there was always music around. And I know that that was um, a big influence for me starting out. They were always very supportive of my curiosity when it came to what things sounded like and wanting to learn more about music and the arts in general. So I think that um, was definitely a big part of how I got started. Um, But even more than that, I would say I've had a series of really supportive teachers and adults who supported and encouraged my curiosity over the years. So thinking back to, you know, my first band director in grades six, seven, and eight, um, you know, really encouraging my creativity and independence. I was playing the bass clarinet and I was the only person in my school playing that instrument. I started to kind of make up my own parts sometimes in the band when I was a little bit bored maybe. (laughs) And he encouraged me to think about maybe writing some music. He said, you know, what you're actually doing is composing and improvising. And I had never really thought about it like that. So thinking back and reflecting on those early experiences, I know that was, um, that was important for me. In my high school experience, I had the opportunity to go to an arts high school where all of the students and teachers for that matter were really understanding of the creative mindset and were encouraging of all of us students to be creative in new ways uh, and to collaborate with each other. There was a lot of cross-curricular collaboration between the arts. So we would do these shows that would involve students in drama, in dance, in music, and visual artists would design the posters and the sets for the shows and things like that. So thinking about how great of an opportunity all of that was for me when I was in the early stages of composing and learning about music, you know, to just be in an environment where all of that was, was encouraged, I think was a pretty big deal for me. Um, But above all else, I would say that the sense of community that I've found in the band room and various band rooms that I have been a part of over the years, uh, I would say that's the biggest influence uh, probably on my life. All of the sort of life skills that I think are my greatest assets now as a person, not not only as a musician, uh, are so many of the things that I developed in the in the band room. So, um, yeah. Okay, that, that, that that's amazing. And uh, so can you talk a little bit about some of those life skills that you feel like you fostered in the band room? Because that's what we're talking about with SEL. How can we foster skills in our music ed classrooms that are going to carry with us for the rest of our lives? Yeah, for sure. I think communication skills is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, not only being able to communicate through an instrument, you know, to communicate a composer's ideas or what your teacher has asked you to do, um, but also to be able to communicate about music, having conversations about what the inspiration behind the, the piece of music is that we're working on, or, you know, being able to adjust as you're working with other musicians to be aware of each other and to know when it's time to take a leadership role, when it's time to be in more of a supportive role, um, building those kind of teamwork 
type collaborative skills. I think that's something that maybe we don't talk about as we're doing it, but it's definitely happening um, during, during every rehearsal and performance experience for sure. Um, I think, you know, being able to access emotion is, is one of the things that you learn in the band room or just in a musical setting in general. Um, you know, when there's a piece of music that is triumphant and joyful, being able to access those feelings within yourself, even if you're having a bad day, but you're in your rehearsal and you're working on a piece that's about joy and about happiness and about love, it makes you feel that way and maybe gives you some of the tools to talk about why you feel that way and what it feels like to experience those kinds of things. And on the flip side, of course, um, music that's about heavier things, heavier emotions or more um, difficult, complicated things in the world that maybe are harder to talk about with words or to articulate in writing. Um, but through music, it seems a little bit more accessible to dive into those difficult things. So those are all skills that um, I think I've, I've developed over the years being involved in music. Um, and certainly confidence as well, being able to, uh, you know, have the independence on an individual part and to know your role within a larger group. Uh, I don't get nervous when I'm presenting or talking to a large group of people. And I think that's because of my years of being a performer in various ways. So all of those things come back to benefit you, you know, not just in a musical setting, but in lots of other ways in life too. Kate, you can write the next book on SEO. That, that, that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, it, it's perfect. Uh, so I want to talk just a little bit about one of those skills in particular that uh, kind of harkens back to that middle school band director that you had who basically didn't tell you no. You know, we, we think of so many models in our profession who says, oh, play those notes, play those rhythms. And yes, we need that. But, you know, when you were on the bass clarinet, probably bored, as you said, just like our percussionists sometimes are and our low brass wing know what was that like what do you think was going through their head when they were trying to facilitate that can you walk us through that ability for the teacher to kind of take a step back so you could take a step forward yeah for sure i mean i i don't know specifically what was going on in his head i've never talked to him about it um but i can imagine and and i've been a teacher of of that age group and so now i can imagine what that might have felt like i was one of the only students in my school uh, who was taking music lessons outside of school. I had been taking piano lessons for just a couple of years. Um, and so I, I knew how to read the notes and the rhythms. Um, I was just zooming through all the fundamental music theory stuff because I was familiar with it already. And so maybe what was going through his head was realizing that here was a student who needed a bit of a challenge, who needed something extra so that they could stay engaged with the material and, and not be bored and also not potentially act out because of knowing all this stuff already, right? So I remember that he gave me the opportunity to coach some of my friends on um, how to determine which, which note values each rest represented because I already knew that and I came up with some sort of rhyme or something that I don't remember now. <laughs> uh, and I taught it to my friends, but he gave me the opportunity to do that. And that kept me from feeling like, you know, rolling my eyes, oh, I know this already, but it put me in a leadership role. And I, I didn't think about it at the time, but it definitely felt good to do that. And when he gave me the opportunity to play the bass clarinet as the only student in the school playing the bass clarinet in a sea of clarinetists and saxophone players and things like that, he saw that perhaps I would be able to handle that kind of independence and um, a role within the ensemble where it was important for me to know what I was doing. It was important for me to be solid and provide a foundation for my friends to play the melodies over top of my bass lines. You know, I, I think I learned a lot about, you know, how to be a supportive ensemble member. And I don't know if I would have learned that as as quickly or as early in my experience if he didn't see the potential in, you know, providing me that opportunity. So I'm not sure if if that's actually what he thought, but reading through the lines, that's kind of what it seems like to me. 
it's a good story regardless. So yeah. we, we can go in <laughs> that direction. You know, Kate, I, I'm hearing so many things that are just SEL 100%. And being a supportive member of an ensemble is the exact same thing as being empathetic in the world and understanding how we relate to our friends, to our colleagues. Um, I want to delve just a little deeper into your role as a teacher, because you said, you know, you went to school to be a teacher and you've had teaching experience. How does that influence your compositional process? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think my experience in the education world, both as a student, a student teacher, and then as a teacher myself, um, it's really helped me to understand what students need in the music in front of them. So when I'm writing music for a middle school band, um, I'm, I'm thinking about things like, how can I make sure that everybody is involved? How can I make sure that everybody is doing something that feels good in their bodies, that sounds good to them and that feels important to them as individual people? I'm thinking about those kinds of things as I'm writing the notes and rhythms and melodies. I'm not just writing music for the sake of representing my own ideas, but I'm writing music for the sake of hopefully presenting an opportunity for musicians and teachers and audiences to learn something through the process of interacting with my music or at the very least, just maybe think about something, reflect on something um, through through bringing my my ideas to life. So I'm thinking about that all the time. And, you know, I, I know what it's like to be a middle school band director and to have to teach the students a new key signature, for example, that they've never seen before, or a syncopated rhythm that they all look at and go, ah, I don't know how this is supposed to go, right? Um, so I'm able to present those new ideas in really accessible, engaging ways so that hopefully everybody's learning something but without realizing that they're learning something. Uh, so I'm, I'm really thankful for my experience as a teacher and in the education realm because I think it, it really informs um, the, the writing that I do as a composer. And the other ways of course um, would be that because I am a trained teacher, I'm comfortable working with groups of musicians of all ages. So as a visiting composer, as a guest artist in a school, whether it's virtually like this, or I have the opportunity to travel and, and meet them in person, sometimes I get to speak to the audience before the performance of a piece of mine. Sometimes I'm offered the opportunity to guest conduct one of my pieces. And not every composer is comfortable doing things like that. So because I was, I was a teacher first, and I've been a performer, I've been in the band from every, every perspective, um, I think I just have a bit more of a well-rounded approach to what I do. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Okay, the connection that you put into your music is tangible on this end as someone who has performed your music and conducted your music. And I think you give us very tangible touch points to connect to our students' lives. So you, you brought up one of the biggest things when it comes to SEL, and that's giving the students an opportunity to reflect, to reflect about the piece of music, how it connects to their lives. So I'd like to just explore that just a little bit more because in your pieces, we see some pretty major themes. Some people will call them social justice elements. Some people would just call them life elements. And I think that is what uh, attracts me to your music so much is that it is something that is powerful, that it's beyond the notes and rhythms on the sheet. So let's start to go in that direction, if you wouldn't mind. Um, you know, I know that environmentalism and our current climate crisis is something that you are, are very passionate about and that it appears in a lot of your pieces. Could you give us a few examples maybe of some pieces that maybe at different levels that you feel might be a great piece if we have students who are passionate about that to connect to that in their lives and maybe some ideal ways that you think students might reflect upon that? Yeah, absolutely. So some of these pieces that I'll suggest will be for concert band, but there are also a few chamber music pieces that I think are examples of, of all of these issues as well. And even if these are not pieces that um, would be doable by a, a music class necessarily, it would be a good opportunity to do some listening and reflecting. So I think it's still worth talking about if that's okay with you. Um, so 
The first piece that comes to mind is Lake Superior Suite. And this is a piece for advanced wind ensemble. So maybe not so much for the middle schoolers, but for advanced high school ensembles, college university ensembles, and so on. Um, this is a, a five movement work about five provincial and national parks located on the north shore of Lake Superior, which of course is the largest freshwater lake in the world and a place that's very near and dear to my heart that I've spent a lot of time at. And I think that it would be a great entry point for students and teachers and just communities in general to talk about the importance of preserved land, to talk about what it means to have a national park and to visit that park. Why is it significant? And, and how, how is it different from just the ground that we walk on outside our house in our, in our neighborhood near school? How is this area different? Why is it important? And, um, also linking it to history. Uh, there's one movement of the piece which is called Nays, named after Nays Provincial Park. And this provincial park was used as a prisoner of war camp uh, during the Second World War and following the war was used as a processing center, holding center for Japanese Canadians who had been in internment camps in Western Canada. Uh, and this would be a really good opportunity to start to talk about some of these problems. I know this is not environmentalism necessarily, but just while we're here talking about oh, Lake Superior it's, Suite. <laughs> it, it, it's all related. It's all related. It's all part of what we're doing. Please go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, essentially, when I visited this park, uh, I learned a piece of my own family's history that I didn't know before visiting this park. I learned that my own family members had spent time in this camp, uh, held their you know, against their will, without a choice, without being able to leave. And this is a very remote area of Ontario. This is a place that even today, the highway doesn't go directly there. It's, you know, it's really in the middle of nowhere and it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. So the opportunity to study, you know, the landscape, the geography and geology and ecology, all of these things in this area, but to pair that with what would it have felt like for people to be in this beautiful place, but not by choice? And what does that say about our government and our society? And, you know, this, this idea that there are people who are considered the other, even people who were born in this country. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of Canada, but I know that a lot of this relates to America as well. And um, I think sometimes it's hard to have these conversations that are really deep and really difficult um, to talk about our history, but maybe through music, it would be a little bit easier to start to bridge the gap between what we know and what we don't or what we're comfortable with and what we're not comfortable with talking about. So that's one example. I mean, what I did with the music in that movement is it's very slow. There's not a lot going on. It requires an immense amount of patience and, um, you know, an awareness. But essentially, the music tells the story of, um, well, the, the untold stories, right, that the people who lived through this experience have not been able to share themselves, maybe out of fear or because they've suppressed their experiences for so long that they're not able to share their own stories. And so I see this as an opportunity for myself to start to tell these stories on behalf of others. And when I put this piece of music into the hands of other people, they now have the responsibility of telling these stories. And so we're giving a voice to people who are potentially not even here anymore or who are not able to use their own voice, but it's beyond me now. It was my piece of music that I created, but the more people who play this music all over the world, the more that these stories are told, the more that these conversations can begin in, in a way that feels comfortable, you know, and that's, I think, the greatest privilege that I have as a composer to be able to start these conversations and, um, and trust that every community that interacts with my music will do something unique and something meaningful for them. Oh, it's powerful. It's a gift that you give to the profession, to the world. And it's kind of like seeing your kids go off to college, right? It's like, okay, you hope that they have learned enough and you hope that it is 
uh, in good enough shape that when you get it out there, it's going to speak for themselves. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so powerful. So, so powerful. And I'll attest that it does. Uh, so other pieces that you've put out there that might have just a really heartfelt message that you hope is going to accomplish something similar. Yeah, for sure. On the easier side of things, I have a piece called Chasing Sunlight, which I know lots of people are familiar with at this point. Um, but it is inspired by the experience of driving west into the setting sun. And so one could argue that this piece is about nature and about the relationship between, um, you know, the, the sun and the person who's seeking out that beautiful experience. But you can also see a connection between nature and the human experience because you can see the sunset as being a metaphor for, um, you know, a, a goal that you have or an experience, something that you're striving for, something, something that you're hopeful about that's just out of reach. And every, every group that I've worked with on that piece, whether it's a young elementary school, middle school ensemble, or a community ensemble full of adult musicians, every single ensemble that I've worked with on this piece is able to relate to this message of being hopeful about something and chasing an opportunity before it has passed. And so you can connect the dots between nature and that symbolism of, of hope and the human experience as well. Uh, a couple others that might be interesting is one is called In Dreams. This is a piece for concert band and it is basically uh, the musical representation of the emotional experience of pursuing a dream. So for me, it was about my dream of being a composer and my dream of being able to make a living doing my favorite thing in the world, which is now my reality. <laughs> but when I was writing this piece, there was a lot of hesitation. There was a lot of anxiety, a lot of, uh, of self-doubt. And so the opening section of this piece is very exposed and it requires everybody to just basically put the energy out into the space to support each other in playing these really exposed lines of music with not a lot of support. And that's intentional because I wanted it to represent how I felt going in this direction by myself, not sure if it was going to work or not. Um, you know, and eventually the piece builds to this beautiful moment where everybody's playing together and it's this dance with the dream and it's working, you know. And so that's a really good opportunity, I think, for teachers and students to talk about the, the feelings that we experience when we're, you know, going for our, our goals and um, setting those intentions for ourselves and, and experiencing setbacks, you know, and, um, and pushing through something with confidence, even if you're not sure of yourself. There are so many experiences that students of all ages go through that would connect to that. So it doesn't have to be that you, you have the dream of being a composer. Um, you know, that was just my personal experience, but my hope through pieces like that is that it will, they'll resonate with people in other ways too. The number one way for us to teach resilience, for us to teach perseverance, is to help our students set their own goals. Uh, we do that really, really well in education. We set goals for our students, and then we tell them how well they achieve those goals. What I love about everything you just said is it puts it on the student, that the student's able to set their own goals, to articulate their own dreams, and then to say, you know, this is where I want to go. That's at the heart of all this. You know, as you were talking, I, I did want to go back just for one second, because when you were talking about just the pristine nature of Lake Superior and what that looks like and that being a preserved space, it really got me thinking about respect and that that land is respected and how that could be an entry point for us to talk about how we need to respect ourselves, how we need to respect our own dreams, how we need to respect each other. Uh, and that, that's, as you so eloquently stated, different from the sidewalk outside of our houses, that that is a space that we come together that's sacred and that we are sacred and that is just so important. So, so thank you. As we're talking about how sacred we are as individuals, I know that another area that manifests uh, in your own life and in your music is mental health and how important that is. Can you talk a little bit about that world and how that manifests in your music? Yeah, for sure. Um, mental health is something that we all have. It's something that, um, you know, not not everybody has mental illness, but everybody knows somebody who does, I think, at this point in, in life. And, you know, building um, 
the emotional vocabulary to be able to talk about how you feel is I think the biggest barrier in terms of conquering this stigma around mental health. So many people just don't know how to talk about how they feel. They don't know how to support others that are going through a hard time. Um, they're not sure what words to pair with their emotions and their experiences. And because of that, um, I think a lot of people just kind of turn inward and, and don't communicate with each other when they need help. And music is such a great tool for being able to, um, to, to break through that, I think. Um, whether it's just, you know, setting, setting the tone of a safe space in the music room at school. Like I, I remember when I was in high school and high school was a pretty tough time for me. Um, and I always felt like I could be myself when I went to the music room. I always felt like even if I didn't know how to talk about what was going on, I could go there and there would be people who would be accepting and understanding and respectful, as you said, of whoever I was in that moment, whatever I was going through in that moment. And people who don't have a relationship with music, I think are really missing out on that opportunity to you know, connect with each other and connect with themselves to do a little bit of self-reflection. Um, I think that one, one thing that's become important to me in my role as a composer is writing music about mental health, about the experiences that I've had and to encourage other people to be more open in conversation about their own experiences. So I have a piece called Tundra and this is a piece for euphonium and piano but I'm also releasing a few other versions of it for other solo instruments because I want to spread the message farther. Um, but this was a commission for a recital um, that was featuring music that was all about the experience of living with depression. And the, the intention behind this recital was that presenting, a, presenting all of this music would potentially encourage the audience to think about their own mental health and to talk amongst themselves, to start some conversations with each other about mental health. And now that I realize, you know, I, this piece was so difficult for me to write because it was so personal. I had to be very vulnerable and honest with myself and to release that out into the world is a little bit scary, but I realized that, um, the more people who engage with that piece, the more people who are continuing to spread that message of, we need to talk about this. We need to help each other out. We need to be more open with ourselves and with each other. So if a piece of music that I write can be, as you said earlier, a portal or a gateway for people to start to explore these things, um, then, then it's absolutely worth the effort and the difficult moments of, of having to piece it together myself. Yeah, Kate, you know, I mean, when we look at it, you know, as musicians, as composers, there's no place to hide. We have to be vulnerable. We put ourselves out there on stage. You know, if we are do something well, the whole world knows. If we're not doing something well, well, the whole world knows. <laughs> uh, it, that That's the reality of the field that we've chosen. And that's the beauty of the field that we've chosen. The, the very first thing you said when you started talking about that was emotional vocabulary. And that's step one of SEL. Do we have the words? Because we know if we go into a class and we say, hey, how's everybody doing? Fine. <laughs> Doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it. Um, Kate, uh, on behalf of the profession, is there any plan to maybe expand Tundra to solo with wind ensemble? Yes, I have thought about this. Um, I'm not sure at what point this will happen, but I have I have thought about making it into a mini concerto of sorts, right? Where it would be the solo part and instead of piano, perhaps wind ensemble, perhaps orchestra, maybe even a flexible ensemble so that anybody anywhere could do it. I haven't started yet, but it's something that's, you know, on my radar and hopefully will become a reality at some point. Oh, the second you were talking, I was just like, I'll program it. <laughs> Done. Um, <laughs> the, the whole point that we're talking about here is destigmatizing. Can we destigmatize mental illness? And we're well beyond the point that this should even be something that we're talking about, but we know that it's a reality. And mental health at all capacities, we all have mental health on a continuum. It doesn't need to be an illness. It is something that I think every single teacher who's ever been in the classroom sees tangibly in the students in front of them. And knowing that we're not counselors, we're not counselors, we're not therapists, but we know that 
our music classrooms can be cathartic and the music is going to be what's going to be uh, what, what's going to guide that to the place that we need to be And a piece like tundra certainly could hit a home run to help us do that i love the idea you know we, we've been talking with a few composers about the flex uh, ensemble and what does that look like uh knowing the current challenges that we're having uh now with the pandemic uh can you talk a little bit about how you're engaging in, in that world you, how has the pandemic affected your creative output yeah, so the pandemic has really flipped everything upside down for everybody. I miss band. I miss live music. I miss the energy in a room when musicians are together creating something. Even just the sound of people warming up and tuning like that, that sounds like cacophony to the average person. But to me, it's like a safe feeling of home. <laughs> and I, I really miss that feeling these days. And so to be honest, it has been difficult to stay motivated and inspired to write music for large ensembles when I'm not sure if and when it will be possible to have those pieces performed. It's been difficult to wrap my head around how to create music that is adaptable and flexible to suit the times. It's been difficult for me to find inspiration when stuck inside the same place all the time. I, I used to travel so much and my favorite way of starting a new piece was to go to a new place and then try to represent the experience of being there through sound, through music. So I've had to get creative and I've, I've explored, you know, my home neighborhood more than probably ever. I've listened to more music that is not my own, not the music that I'm working on, but just taking the time to appreciate the music of my colleagues, of, of other people who are creating new stuff. And, um, you know, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I really hit some sort of wall where I just felt like I wasn't able to be creative. I, I was in survival mode. I wasn't able to think beyond that, but I've, sort of come around now and I feel like I'm in this new stage of of recognizing the importance of music in everybody's lives right now and that even non-musicians are turning to music and to the arts as a form of you know a, as a creative outlet an emotional outlet even just being able to connect to the lyrics of a song or something like that I've just realized more than ever, the role that music plays in all of our lives. And so I see it as, you know, I have the opportunity to continue to create music that other people can use to make connections with each other, with the world around them. Uh, why would I stop doing that just because everything else in the world seems to have stopped, you know? So I've, I've found a new sense of, um, of direction and focus probably just in the last month or so. Um, so I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to harness that and, and create some meaningful work. Can you let us in behind the, the curtain, so to speak? Is there an exciting project that you're working on now? Well, one thing that I'm hoping to do starting this winter is um, getting back to my songwriting roots. So when I first started writing music, it was not music for band or for euphonium or, you know, choir. It was myself at the piano or at the guitar singing songs about how I felt about various things. And I've never recorded that music. I've never pursued that side of my musicality beyond just playing the songs you know in my bedroom or something like that and so I've decided that I want to start to record some of that music so that maybe I can reach a different audience through the music that I've written and uh, so that's one thing that I want to try to do it's it's something that I'm a little bit scared of something that um, I'm nervous about doing but I think that if you're not a little bit nervous uh, it's maybe maybe it's not as worth doing like everything that's worth doing comes with some element of apprehension. So I see that as a sign that it's something that I should do. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that I've come to really love writing chamber music and I think I want to apply my newfound love for smaller groups of instruments to hopefully creating some flexible pieces, not necessarily arrangements of existing work, but to think a little bit outside the box and create brand new pieces of music for smaller, smaller groups of instrumentalists, uh, maybe even including singers, just kind of pushing myself, I guess, to think about how I can create 
pieces that are just as meaningful as my large ensemble works that are meant to be played with tons of people on stage in front of other large groups of people, how can I take that same process and apply it to the new situation that we're in? So tough and, and, and so worthwhile. I love what you said about if it's not tough, if it doesn't make you a little bit nervous, then maybe it's not worth doing. I had something come across my inbox today that um, made me feel uncomfortable. And that's why I said yes. So I, I think spot on. But, you know, there was like, oh, no, I can't. Yeah, I should. <laughs> uh, so absolutely. Thank yeah. you. For providing and that's that that's model. one of the things, too, that I think you learn in the band room or that you learn through through music, right, is is that oh, you've got a solo in this part. You don't have the, the option to say no. This is what the composer wrote for you. It's it's taking these opportunities to step outside your comfort zone. And I don't know if that's a life skill per se, but it's something that we all need to do over the course of our lives. And some of the earliest experiences that I have with, with encountering that are in music in the band room. So I know many people who aren't good stepping outside of their comfort zone. So I would call it a critical life skill. Absolutely. And this is, you know, we say that, you know, the music ed classroom, our band classrooms, our choir classrooms, our orchestra classrooms, our general music classrooms aren't, they don't like accidentally teach SEL. They don't teach SEL just because you're there, but it gives us the opportunity to practice these skills. And what you just said was perfect. If I have a solo, well, step up. It's time, it's go time. Uh, it's an opportunity to practice that skill of putting yourself out there. Yeah, exactly. So one more question, and then we'll, we'll start wrapping things up here. The big question that I have right now is during that time, during the pandemic, you said you were, you know, you kind of hit that brick wall where you weren't getting inspired. I know that nature inspires you. What are some other things in this world that you find inspirational? That's a good question. Uh, nature is the biggest one for me, of course, but I think also um, I really just love to observe human interaction. I, I love, um, and I can't do this very much right now, but being in airports or train stations and seeing the look on people's faces when they're reunited with somebody they haven't seen in a long time, or even the opposite of that, the the devastation of saying goodbye to somebody. I, I really respond to these kinds of emotional interactions. So it's been tough during the pandemic to just not be around a lot of people because I think basically my biggest source of inspirations um, sources of inspiration are nature, which I can access to a limited degree, but not as much as when I could travel and people. And that of course is also limited right now, but I've been so inspired to see how music educators have reinvented themselves and reinvented what music education looks like right now. I've been inspired by students who are getting together virtually with their friends to create these recordings of music that they like. You know, I think that the reason that I've been able to pull myself out of feeling stuck is because of seeing other people do that, seeing other composers create this, this new wave of flexible literature, seeing other performers do live streams and, you know, um, create pretty lights and things in the background to make it seem like they're on stage, even though they're just in their bathroom or something like that. I just, I love seeing people reinvent themselves because it reminds me that it's possible. And it reminds me that I've done that before and I, I can do that again. So those are just some of the things, um, you know, that, that have kept me going lately. I have to have faith that within the next little bit of time, we're going to have absolutely wonderful hellos that we're going to have absolutely wonderful moments of reuniting and whether it's in an airport or whether it's when the, when we have the ability to rejoin each other safely, that that is just going to be a wondrous time. Uh, I told my students at the wind ensemble at Lake forest college, many a times that the first time that we rehearse, baton's going to drop. I'm going to get through two bars and I'm just going to be crying like a baby. So just give me 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back and we're going to go. But, but that that's what we're longing for. And seeing those models, you know, I, I think that's one of the most powerful things that we can do as teachers and as adults and as mentors and whatever capacity we're serving is to model, to model how we navigate strength, how we not navigate weakness, how we navigate hellos, how we navigate goodbyes. So, so thank you for that. 
Kate, um, before we just, uh, I, I have one more formal question, but before we, we get there, uh, is there anything else that you would like to share about your music and social and emotional learning? Because I know you haven't called it SEL before I reached out to you and said, hey, there's this thing called SEL. Do you want to come and join this podcast? Um, so any other thoughts? Well, I definitely, I, I don't, I haven't been calling it SEL when I think about you know, when I'm composing, when I'm working with others. But as I've come to learn more about this, I realized that there are so many ways that my career and just my life in general um, connects to SEL. And I wish that, um, that I had learned about it sooner. I think that my number one priority when I'm creating music is that I'm thinking about what people will learn from interacting with my music, you know, that it's every, every perspective. So the students, the performers, the teachers, the audience, the parents, right? What what conversations can I start um, through the music that I present to all of these people? And if it's something that inspires me, if the piece of music is about something that has moved me in a way, I have to hope and assume and trust that that will move other people too. And just one other example of a piece that I, I'm just thinking about right now. Um, it's a brass quintet called Valley Views, and uh, it's in three movements. But the, the second movement specifically, I wrote um, about the forest fires in California and Oregon. And I had spent some time there a couple of years ago and was just so so struck by the destruction and devastation of all of the trees that I had to drive through to get to where I was going. And I thought, how can I, how can I tell more people about this? How can I tell people that this is something we should all care about, even on the other side of the continent, even on the other side of the world? There are so many things going on in the world that we are just not aware of because they don't directly impact us. So I, I hope and assume that this is a way that SEL comes into play in the music that we look at. Just that, you know, if if you're doing the second movement of, of this piece and you read the program notes and read that this really somber piece of music was inspired by this experience of seeing forests for acres and acres that are just gone now and, and how much of an impact that has not only on those ecosystems, but on the whole world. And that can lead into a discussion around climate change and a discussion around individual and societal responsibility in terms of taking care of our planet. And, you know, that I have a privilege to start those conversations is just, that's really what makes me feel like I have, uh, that I'm, I'm living my dream, that I get to be a person who's part of starting that process of thought and reflection. So I, I have learned a lot through talking to you and um, reading about SEL. And I think it'll maybe influence how I write music going forward. I, I already have been thinking about these things, but knowing that there's maybe a name for it, uh, it'll, it'll help me focus a little bit more on those things. Okay, and I'm getting choked up a little bit. Uh, th thank you so much. That, that was just really, really powerful and know that you are starting these conversations. I've been in classrooms working on your music and these conversations are being had and it, it's a powerful Kickstarter. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave you with this question. Um, do you have any advice for our music teachers who are struggling to keep their heads above water, who uh, we all feel like we're first year teachers again, we're all doing our best, uh, but oftentimes we feel like we're not doing as well as we should be. Do you have any advice for those teachers? Well, I'll start by saying I certainly don't envy anybody right now who is trying to navigate this distance learning thing from the perspective of a teacher, a parent, a student. I, I would have felt so disappointed to be any of those people in this scenario right now, just to be missing out on so much of what makes school what it is or, or what it has been for everybody. And I will say thank you to all of the music teachers out there right now who are trying to continue to inspire their students, even if they're not feeling inspired themselves. I think that it's such a tough job and I really admire all of the tenacity and um, resilience that's being displayed in music education right now. In terms of advice, um, I think that 
being a role model for your students is probably the most important thing that you can do. It's not necessarily even about how much of the curriculum you cover. I know that's important. I know you have to get through the content and the material, but what kids will take away from their experience with you is how they felt and if they were seen and if they were heard and if they felt motivated to be better versions of themselves. I think there are so many ways as educators that we can set that tone and set that expectation. And, you know, if, if a teacher is feeling burnt out, that's totally understandable. And that's also going to spread to the community. It's going to spread to the students. If, if students can tell that their teachers are, are not feeling inspired or are not feeling good about what they're doing, that's going to rub off on, on everybody. So I think my, my advice there is to practice self-care, to do things that help you feel like your best self, even if it's not 100% your best self, doing little things to help you feel like this is who I am and this is why I do this so that you can present that energy to your students because that kind of energy is really tangible and even through a screen, through Zoom or whatever platform it is, your students can tell how you're feeling. So being more, more honest with yourself and doing whatever it takes to, to take care of yourself, that will benefit your entire community, I think. Okay, 100%. Our mantra right now uh, in the SEL world uh, is needs before notes, that we have to take care of our needs. We'll get back to notes. We'll yes. get back to concerts. We'll get back to pushing up to Lake Superior Suite. But for right now, needs. Yes. 100%. Kate, from the bottom of my heart, this was fabulous. This was absolutely perfect to help us crawl inside your music and to understand how your music's going to serve as that portal for that gateway into these really, really essential uh, conversations and questions that we can pose to our students. Kate, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. On behalf of Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Have a good day. Music for All's mission is to create provide and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to create a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. I want to thank Kate Nishimura for the incredibly vulnerable and raw discussion she had with us today, suggesting all of these wonderful entry points through her music to talk about environmentalism, mental health, and the reality in our classrooms. I want to thank her for this heartfelt contribution to this series and enlightening us on how to make music with heart for all students. I'd like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educator Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com. And I'd also like to thank GIA Publications for their continued support. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you.